we can get rid of my otter. We don't have to have that in here. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Yeah, I, I thought I let you in and then then it was, do you want to admit chanting? I'm like, wait a second. I just did. <laughs> yeah, uh, so you can get rid of my otter. It doesn't need to be going. Perfect. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I've never been better. Good. Always good. good. Always good. It's a roller coaster, but I'm always headed in the right direction. So well, that's called entrepreneurship. Yeah. <laughs> uh overnight success. I'm still waiting for it. Well, you know, I had someone tell me ask me one time, how did you become such an overnight success? I'm like 30 years. Yep. Yep. 30 years. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Uh, very straightforward. Just have a fun, free-flowing conversation. I typically like to pin it around 20 or 30 minutes, but I know the two of us could talk for hours. Um, so maybe we'll maybe we'll wrap up uh, and have another conversation in the upcoming months. Yeah, definitely. Perfect. Do you have any questions for me? No. Nope. I figure right, you have so... questions for me and we'll go from there, right? Yeah, yeah. I just... <laughs> I typically don't do a bunch in preparing. I just let the conversation go. And I think it just, it's a good organic feel. At yeah. least that's my input. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Seem okay. okay. Everything's fine. Yes. And then uh, at, we'll cut the front, cut the back at the end. I'll thank you for your time again. I'll do a little summary of our conversation that we'll throw on the front side of it. Okay. And as far as reaching out or connecting with you, is the dot com the place to go? Correct. Okay. And that's advancedaccounting.com. Correct. I love how you filled out the form. Uh, tell me how you'd like to be introduced. Tax strategist. Tax strategist. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Some people put like these just paragraphs yeah. and paragraphs. I'm like, how am I supposed to say that on an intro? <laughs> love it. All right. Well, let's rock and roll. Well, the time has come. Shannon, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you so much for your time today. Good to be here. Thank you. I don't think the listeners have any clue what we're in for today. Uh, they just, it's kind of like how I stumbled upon your path or how our paths cross is, is so remarkable. And I'm so excited to share, share you with the world here on the Real Estate <laughs> Mogul MD. So on the Real Estate Mogul MD, we talk with a lot of physicians, coaches, investors, entrepreneurs, and you're so many of these things, one of them of which you're not, you're not a doctor. I'm not a doctor, um, but you have studied and you have a very specific niche that you're in, and I love that, and I want to share that with the listeners. Could you just start by letting the listeners know a little bit about your background, your professional background, where you started and where you're at now? You definitely. So I started years ago as uh, one of two advisors that worked for General Electric, and I worked helping the GE presidents and employees of GE mitigate taxes and do financial planning. And then from there, GE, as that does, decided that our business was no longer a business they wanted and they sold us off. And I determined to start my own business. And so that was about 30 years ago. Wow. And I started a full service uh, tax planning, accounting, full service firm that caters to entrepreneurs and real estate investors. Entrepreneurs and real estate investors. Those two things just light my candle right there. I absolutely love it. And I've heard you say before, I'm an entrepreneur who is a tax strategist. And yeah. that's such a cool perspective of it. And that's why I, lo I love our conversations. I can't wait to get into more of this here. But what does that mean to you when you say, I'm an entrepreneur and a tax strategist? So I don't think like a typical tax professional. Oftentimes when you're working with like a CPA, um, they're very, very conservative in their outlook on everything. So I have, before I even ever put on my tax professional hat, I'm thinking as an entrepreneur. I'm thinking of everything that I do from that entrepreneurial standpoint. Then I filter it through my tax professional lens um, and not the other way around. Um, that often lends itself to mean that I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm very, um, I'm not risk adverse. Now, that does not mean anything I'm going to ever walk in the gray with one of my clients or anything of that nature, because I also do representation work, meaning I represent people when they get in trouble with the IRS. 
but I'm not going to look at it of all the worst case scenarios that are going to happen. What I'm going to look for is what's the entrepreneurial opportunity here? How do we take advantage of that opportunity while within the scope and the framework of all the tax laws? And that's kind of kind of how we met. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to kind of backtrack this thing. We met, you were working with uh, a high income individual, had a um, what they call a trigger moment in his career we had sold a business or part of the sale of a business and was looking at all this capital and saying shannon what do i do uh, and you were helping him out so i had met that person through a mastermind that we were in um, and that gentleman's name is perry marshall that put this together so if the listeners have not heard of perry marshall i just want to encourage everybody to go out um the books the groups, the masterminds, it is, I'm just dumbfounded. I found myself sitting at dinner at the table with Perry Marshall in New Orleans. And, you know, we started talking about things. And the one, obviously, thing that, you know, the Evolution 2.0. And then um, I don't think that we actually talked about memos um, from the head office. But that's where I learned of you after we started working uh, with the one yeah. client and there's telling the story in memos of the head office another great book everybody should go out and get it is yeah. this story of shannon and so, yeah how... here's the book actually so <laughs> yeah. memos from the head office that's amazing and tell us a little bit about just like a a brief summary of how that came about how did you end up in that book did you know perry before then or what was the what was the story about so i engaged perry um years ago like most people do from a marketing standpoint because he's a marketing guru and um i actually went out to one of his city tours in colorado one of my cpas that works for me said you need to meet perry marshall and so he he actually paid for me to have a hot seat at one of his city tours Oh, wow. And I showed up and I started um, speaking to Perry and immediately we connected. I did not know what memos from head office was at the time. So I'm a former um, American Baptist pastor, but um, Perry, I said to Perry, can I give you a word about something? Um, at, and he's like, oh, what is like Perry was all over. Like he was like <laughs> clapping his hands, ready to hear something from me. And I gave him, I gave him a word um, about the future. And he was like, do you know what a memo is? I'm like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And, he, and then that just grew our friendship. Um, and Perry and I um, have become good. You know, I consider him a friend. Um, and, you know, when I go to Chicago, I drop my kid off at their house so they can play and things of that nature. They don't play. They're, they're older yeah. children now. <laughs> um, but, you know, Perry has a great organization. So you met me through Memos from Head Office. So Memos from Head Office is a... Is, a program that Perry has where people can actually, entrepreneurs and business owners can actually um, get on a call and have someone give them um, a word, an intuitive word about the future or about something that they're dealing with. And so he has what we call expert memo calls where you can actually get with an expert. So like I, I was a tax strategist expert who gives the ability to actually give intuitive readings. Um, and it's a non-religious thing. It's a non, like it's a DMZ zone, non-religion, um, you know, so that anyone of any walk or any faith can actually come and actually get that word for the future. Interesting. And I know in that, that book, Perry's whole start was uh, the Google, the book that he wrote about um, Google AdWords and stuff and how right. that all came about. Uh, interesting. Uh, is kind of want to lead this conversation into not only you an entrepreneur, and a tax strategist, but you also invest in real estate. So I'm going to tie all of this together. But first, okay. before we get there, well, tell us a little bit about your real estate investing. So, I mean, years ago, so um, at the peak of my real estate, I had 27 individual rental properties. Um, and unfortunately, then I went through a divorce. And so that kind of whittled all of those things away. Um, today, I do mostly commercial real estate. Um, and so I don't, not office buildings, but more industrial retail type spaces from that standpoint. And I'm looking for those, you know, um, those commercial spaces that have the triple net leases. They're kind of, they're, they're, the, they're the foundation of my portfolio that just begins to spin off that reoccurring, you know, six, 7%, you know, cap rate that kind of is just my, my automatic wealth creation. In that six and seven percent cap, are you looking at any of the 
equity multiples? Do you do you plan on turning these things to capture any of that equity, or is it just the cash? Eventually, flow? I mean, I think it's all based on every single um, property. It has its own characteristics, and so really, as they're added to the portfolio, we I revisit them, you know, periodically to determine if it's if if it's the right time to sell, um, you know, and my my frame around real estate has always been that um you know it comes from my grandfather my grandfather always used to say that invest in things that you can never lose and so he always the only thing he ever held in his portfolio was real estate because you always had he said um he was not an educated man i actually was the one of the first in my family to ever even go to college but he always said no one can ever take your your education or knowledge that you've accomplished in the world and your real estate you're always going to have those things um, and so um, real estate is really the bedrock, but every single property has its own characteristics and why you would hold it or not hold it, you know, over a period of time. And then now tying this back to the memos to the head office kind of perspective, and even in a religious perspective as well, too. It's mm -hmm. so hard, like juggling these things when we're looking at real estate. How did all of this tie into real estate or does it tie into real estate for you, Shannon? Well, I mean, so first of all, my life, so I always tell people, um, some of the other podcasts I have out there about memos is that I live my life one memo to the next. So it's become a practice of mine to actually sit in my Renaissance time, what I call my Renaissance time in the morning and just listen. And I start out like, Father God, what would you have me to know today? So it might be like, you know, um, it could be something about my portfolio. I always ask that about my clients, like what I'm getting ready to meet with Brett today. Is there something that you would want me to say for him? Or is there something that you would have for him today? Um, and so when I'm thinking of like a memos from a memo standpoint, I'm all. who brings things to me. And um, it, it's so funny. He's gotten used to working with me. I'll be like, hard no. Like, he, go ahead. Oh, one second. Sorry. Could could you rewind back some of the, uh, the internet signal froze and you froze on me? Oh. I'm sorry okay. about that. So it was right <laughs> okay. back. We started talking about the memos piece. Yeah. Yep. So it, it was, um you were, you know, you had you set in your renaissance time, you ask for the day memo to memo kind of thing. And you were just going into it from there and it froze. I'm so sorry. No worries. No worries. So when I sit with my renaissance time, my quiet time, um, that's like my devotional time. Um, I'm asking like, Father God, is there anything I need to know about X, Y, or Z? Because, you know, oftentimes we are so busy in our lives that we're just like, especially as entrepreneurs, especially as serial entrepreneurs, we're like, you know, just plugging ahead, getting through our day, getting what we need to be done from our business standpoint and our personal standpoint. So I'm asking, and I hear out of my right ear, is there anything I need to hear today? Is there anything I need to know today? So I have a um, a real estate broker who bring who was always emailing me deals. Like, and he'll say, 8% cap rate, you know, and you need to you know jump on this. And he's gotten so used to me saying, no, hard no. Yes, yeah. no. I'll look at that, no. And, and before, when we first started working together, before he understood memos, he'd be like, well, let's have a conversation. And I'm like, it's already been decided. Mm -hmm. It's already been decided. And mm -hmm. so memos gives me the ability to have really strong intuitive nature, uh, that intuitive nature that I can make decisions very quickly um, with, with a high degree of confidence. Um, and so um, Perry's, Perry's organization for memos is a great place for people are at, you know, questions about that, that they can plug in and learn more about yeah. that kind of thing. And I love how that, that you related it specifically to real estate. And, and I'm just pulling back again, a note from the book, uh, a warning of, mm -hmm. you know, not making hasting, hastily movements, hastily movements and, you know, things that could damage you and, and thinking that it's a memo or thinking that you've gotten this specific information. And the one, uh, example i remember i think it was uh, another gathering or event and um they decided to do a free instead of a small monthly thing and it totally crumbled the business so always watching out and, and you know having that 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 sense of caution around it when we are talking about business um mm -hmm. when it comes to uh those kinds of intuitive 
thoughts. So you always want confirmation, 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 yeah. right? You always want, um, you know, from a Christian perspective, we always are like, you know, if you get a word, a word of knowledge or a memo from head office, where is it, where can it be backed up or where is there confirmation for that? So as you, you know, for me being in the, sitting in kind of the driver's seat of as um, someone who gives memos and receives memos, over 30 years, over time, I've developed that confidence. But you always want to make sure that, you know, if you don't have peace in something, you should probably, like, if you have a, that gut check, then mm -hmm. you need to obey your, obey that, you know, and be like, oh, I need more information. I don't have enough information in this situation. Interesting. And, I, and whenever I have conversations like this, I always feel like I, I need to uh, ease things, um, not trying to offend people, but I love mm -hmm. that we were able just to, to talk about it and, and you know, the, the, the religion thing, there's tuition, their intuition, there's religion, all of these things. And so many of us in the human nature have these sort of intuition, these feelings, and I'm relating it back to like the infinite mindset and being comfortable and confident, um, and content, but not complacent. And just having in this, in this presence where everything is possible. And the more that I relax and listen, to uh, and see what I've been given, then there's so much more that's available. You mentioned um, that, unfortunately, you know, you had gone through a, a divorce or fortunate, depending on how the situation was for you. Uh, I, I just want to talk about that just for a second and how that related to the real estate. And if you could give any of the listeners who may be experiencing something similar, uh, maybe going through a divorce or had gone through a divorce, what was it in regards your learning, your takeaways with mm. in regards to the real estate in that scenario? Well, I think it's just overall good advice. I think that um I think that when I look back at my own particular situation, I think that um, and this holds true in any business business relationship, because marriage is a business relationship as well. Mm. Um, I think that one of the mistakes that I I have made and I have tend to make is that I don't always get things in writing and I take people at their, at their, I want to believe that people at the heart of them are good. And so should you have a prenup? If you're in a business arrangement, should you have everything in writing? Should you have the start of a relationship in writing? And if it, if it goes south and you need to get out, should you have the exit in writing and agree to everything while things are good? You probably should. And that's not only for marriage. I think that's for, you know, that's for business in general. Um, I'm not a big proponent of partnerships or business partners. Um, I think that if you are in a partnership, then really you need to have everything spelled out really clearly. Yes. The entrance and the exit. Yeah. And, <laughs> All agree, yeah, and exactly. the, and the really divorce. The what happens if there's a divorce, you know? Yeah. Because I mean, that happens in business. You'll have a business partner and there'll be a divorce. Mm -hmm. And of and and a breaking up of the partnership and what does that look like from that standpoint and how and and agree to those things while you guys still like each other, and it's like if this happened could we live with this and let's pray to God that it doesn't happen but if it does happen how do we actually um, part as friends like I just had a business relationship that ended um, and we had everything in writing and so there was no question they were like we're like you know what we're both going in different directions mm -hmm. and. You know, we're in different directions and um, let we've got an agreement. Let's figure out how we get out of it because we don't have the time to dedicate to this particular thing right now. Yeah. So. Um, and then those assets in, in the divorce, back on that little mm -hmm. note, just what are some options that can be? I know in the direct to seller world of single family real estate, mm -hmm. single family residential, We've done a lot with divorces and it's just, it's a tough situation, especially when it's the home that the family lives in and they can't afford anything else. That's a whole nother uh, crazy uh, situation. But in these investment properties, you know, you can liquidate them, you can split them. Or what are some other options that are out there for this particular situation? Because most of the time, Shannon, we're not going to have that, that prenuptial agreement, right? Right. right. So I think one of the things, I mean, definitely there, there is just assignment to one spouse or the other, you know, you're splitting assets. And so, Hey, I'll take the retirement plans and you take the rental properties. So it's a, it's a division of assets from that standpoint. Um, I've seen, um, I've seen a division of assets and then someone 1031 exchange them into a 
to better assets from that standpoint. Oftentimes in divorce, unfortunately, they're sold though. And they're sold at a deep discount, which is great for the investor because we can go in and we can swoop them up, you know, from that standpoint. But unfortunately for the owners of a, when they're going through a divorce, they get so marred in emotional turmoil that they don't necessarily think clearly. Again, that's where um, I would also caution anytime that you're doing something when in from a business standpoint, because rental properties are a business that you try to remove as much emotion as you possibly can. Because when we're emotional that we don't hear well, we don't think well, we react instead of responding. And so learning to practice the pause and learning to respond and not react, especially like in a divorce situation is really critical. And get outside get outside guidance. So let me say this, and I'm not trying to throw divorce attorneys under the bus because I have a client right now who's going through divorce and he just sent me like the proposal just for my feedback. And I'm not an attorney, um, but putting on my tax hat and my financial hat, I, I said to him, well, well, have you considered X, Y, and Z? Like, you know, have you considered this other avenue? And then he went back to the attorney and the attorney's like, oh, I didn't think about that. So do not just necessarily believe that your attorney has all the answers. Make sure that you um, have other outside counsel, like your accountant, like, you know, your financial person, you know, seek other wise counsel, have lots of wise counsel that you can tap into. Well, while you were saying that, <laughs> I heard while you were saying that uh, the react and respond and emotional thing, all I can hear is don't send it, don't send it. Don't send it. <laughs> so whatever, however, anyone may take that out there that's listening, uh, don't send it. So that's just a great way to pause uh, for sure. So we're talking about tax strategy then, Shannon. What are some of the, like the high, the key, the, the highlights of being a tax strategist, an entrepreneur, and a real estate investor? What are your some of your top takeaways from that awesome relationship? Well, you know, here's the thing. I love real estate. Real estate is a, like a great tax haven um, from that standpoint. And I think one of the things that when you're looking at real estate, there's so much that can be done. And really what, and, and so one of the things to say too, is that real estate actually can create a really great legacy for your family. It's a great way to build wealth for your family. And then also pass on a legacy to your heirs at a at a tax advantage, uh, you know, rate. So, for instance, um, you know, if you're holding real estate, you want to, you know, before you ever sell it, you want to consider like, can I 1031 exchanges into something else? If you're holding real estate for a long period of time, should I do a cost segregation study um, to actually accelerate depreciation? Um, and then if I'm getting ready and I'm building my estate plan, am I at a part, uh, point in my life when I don't want to actually liquidate and sell my assets while I'm living? I want to be able to let my heirs inherit them at the step up and basis. So when we're talking about real estate, these are all the great things that you actually can do with real estate. And then when you're looking at creating wealth for your family, if you're looking for the capital appreciation where you're going to actually sell or you're going to um, 1031 that asset into a, a new asset. But what you're also doing is you're creating that automatic um, income and cash flow that's tax advantage to you. So, I mean, it's a really great planning tool, not only from um, a tax planning side, but also a wealth creation um, side of your, of your um, portfolio. Yeah. I love it. I love that path. Depreciate exchange, depreciate exchange, and ultimately uh, depreciate and die. And that, <laughs> that step up in cost basis is the difference maker. So I'm always thinking, you know, if you have a situation where you're going to inherit money, if you could somehow have that put into real estate before it's inherited, then it's a whole different path um, right. that it, it, it could make it to you. Um there was oh the uh the step the step up in basis can you tell us just a little bit more about what that means right so what happens with the step up in basis is let's say you have a property and you purchased it for $100,000 and you've held it for 30 years so you've used all the depreciation you've taken all the depreciation and after 30 years this property is now worth 500,000 well you don't sell it you pass away 
and your heirs inherit it at the step up in basis or what the fair market value is on the date of your death, which would be 500,000. So now that becomes their floor. So if they sell it, they could sell it for 500,000 and pay no taxes, or they could hold on to it and then let it appreciate. So if it's 700,000 when they sell it, their basis is 500. So they only pay the difference between the 500 and the 700 as their capital gains rate. Unless it was a single family home and they lived in it in two of the last five years, right? That's correct. <laughs> so and then, yeah, these... if they, yeah, if they moved into that home, let's say mom and dad, someone passes away, they move into it, it becomes their primary residence, they live in it two out of five years, then they could sell it. At, and we're talking about today's tax law because yeah. tax laws change. But as if they're a jo married joint, they could make up to $500,000 on that sale, income tax free. These are these little nuggets that just, I mean, not all CPAs know, hopefully a, a lot of them will, but there's so many that comes down to strategy. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's so important. I hear a lot when I have, I actually, I heard it once and I keep saying it. That's why I hear it a lot because I say it all the time. <laughs> so we've got passive income and active income. Our passive losses can only offset our passive income unless we have an REP status, real estate professional status. Right. Somebody mentioned this idea to me that I keep just keeps running circles in my mind is if the idea is to get all of our income into the passive bucket. In my mind, that's like, okay, that's maybe all real estate, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. We can structure businesses to have passive income. When I say that, Shannon, what does that mean to you? So, I mean, so... So one of the things I always go to is like, so as an investor as well, like oil and gas, oil and gas as a, can give offer tax advantages if in certain circumstances, but also create passive income. Um, and then we can offset passive losses with that passive income. So if you have passive losses on your real estate and then you have gas and oil, which creates passive income, they can offset the two to create cash flow with no taxation. So I think that's one of the things to consider. Um, again, it's all about living within the definition of the IRS guidelines for passive and active entities and income. And again, that's where the strategy comes in. And you're right. A lot of CPAs or tax professionals, so I'm an enrolled agent, which if you Google enrolled agent, we're the only federally licensed tax professional in the United States. We're known as America's tax strategist. That's where be, being, bringing in a strategist, someone who that's how they're thinking all day long is how do I strategize to pay the least amount of taxes legally possible becomes so important because oftentimes our tax professionals that we're working with are so busy just keeping us in compliance. They don't have a lot of time for strategy. And that's what makes us a little bit different in our engagements with our clients. They actually get advisory services, not just compliance services. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to drill down on that question just a little bit further. How do I create, I know you're not an entity attorney. I understand that. <laughs> um, nor am I. How do I create a business that I can take passive income from? Well, I mean, so I think it's about, okay. So oftentimes when people have entities that have passive income, they already have an active income as well. So they might have a company where they're a hundred percent, um, active in the company, materially participating in the company from that standpoint. So if they're materially participating, so one of the things when you um, fill out a tax return for an entity, you actually say, how much ownership do they have? How many shares do they own? How much of their time are they committed here? And do they materially participate? If you're not mater materially participating in that, then it's oftentimes going to be a passive activity for you. Interesting. And so if I'm building this company, I get to the point where I'm, I've created my systems, my processes, I've brought in the right people, and I've even reached out to you for the concierge CFO, right? Mm -hmm. That's something we could talk about too. And now now the business is taking care of itself. I'm not material partici materially participating in this. My, my income then becomes passive. That's correct. So it depends, again, and again, it depends on what type of entity you are, if you're a C Corp, if you're an S Corp or a partnership. So definitely. But so it's all hinged on how am I actively participating here? But if you're Love just it. like, I mean, there's oftentimes we have, um, you know, 
And it also it depends on like, let's say if you're a partnership, if you're a general partner or a limited partner. And oftentimes I'll see where like, so for instance, um, you might have been a general partner in the first couple of years, and then you aren't materially participating. It isn't really your company that you need to show up every day and do the work. Now you become a limited partner. And so it depends on, on all of those different kind of classifications of but really, the first question is, do I materially participate? Interesting. I love it. And if the listeners want to connect with you, it's advancedaccounting.com. That's correct. Yeah. And there, there's, I mean, you've got so many um, explanation videos on there, ways to connect with you, uh, clients, what they say. I mean, if, if, if they all, if they want a good referral, they could just call me because every time that I see you, every time I see your name, it just puts a smile on my face, Shannon. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, well, thank you for your time and, uh, and for your, uh, experience today. It's absolutely wonderful. Enjoy the conversation. Love to have you back again in the future. I'm sure we're going to have plenty to talk about. So thanks again for your time. Thank you. And to the listeners out there today, that's advancedaccounting.com. Um, there is a massive difference between planning, uh, strategy, and then just getting your taxes done. And just like with our emotions, there's a response and a reaction. And if we can be proactive on this stuff, especially, especially if you have a practice and you're uh, that trigger point, that inflection point where you're going to have these moments, start thinking now. Because if you're reacting instead of responding, then then there's going to be an issue. So getting proactive, the best thing you can do is go to advancedaccounting.com and book a call with Shannon. Get that smiley face all the way from Detroit, the General Electric special, huh? Very, yeah. very cool. So thanks again to the listeners today for your time and most importantly, your attention. Uh, if you have any questions for us, info at physicianwellsystems.com. And we'll see you on the next one. This is the Real Estate Mogul MD. Rap. <laughs> All right. How was it? It was good. It was good. I I mean, we yeah, I hope that it was everything that you wanted it to be. Yeah. I love it. I just I love the free flow. I mean, I get to yeah. learn and all the things that be bounce around in my mind, like the passive business piece. Mm -hmm. And like I get to ask those and drill down on those questions. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. Let me know if you have. If you need more content, I'll be always be around. <laughs> awesome. I love it. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much, Shannon. Enjoy the Bye. rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm so excited about today's conversation. She comes in today listed as tax strategist, but there is so much more to her, to our relationship. I actually met her through uh, Perry Marshall. If you've heard of Perry Marshall before. And she was actually in the book, Memos from the Head Office. We're gonna talk a little bit about the memos from the head office and how she's an entrepreneur that is a tax strategist and how she invests in real estate. How do we tie all of these things together? Well, stay tuned, listen to this. Everybody, please welcome the tax strategist, Shannon Stewart.